the state to things that they will not do. That will be the subject of a different session. Right now what I'd like to do is I'd like to pass the floor to our moderator, uh, uh, Professor Bradford, who is a leading scholar on the EU's uh, regulatory power and uh, a, a, a trusted commentator on the European Union, on the global economy. And uh, she has written extensively on the perhaps um, extensive, if not oversized, influence that some regulatory initiatives in Europe have had on the internet space. She uh, recently was the author of The Brussels Effect, that's the title of her book, How the European Union Rules the World. So as an expert in this area on international trade law, on digital regulation and on antitrust law, uh, we felt it would be very useful if we could ask Professor Bradford to moderate this session. So I will now hand over to her and she will present our speakers uh, so that we can get this discussion started. So over to Professor Bradford. I hope that you're online and that you can hear us. Sorry, I think you may be muted. Thank you. We're, we're being helped. We need to unmute you, apparently. I'm sorry, could I ask the tech support, could you please unmute and give permission to Anu Bradford, who is in the online participation list, please? Anu Bradford. She will be our moderator, so she needs uh, access rights for the entirety of the session. Okay, we can see that you're now unmuted, but we still don't hear you. If perhaps the online support could turn up the volume, please. Now we can. Thank you. It's great that you could join us. Sorry for this technical uh, hiccup. So please, the floor is yours.
just by regulating its own market has been able to rely on the market forces and incentives of companies to then translate that policy into a global policy. So this is very different from the EU imposing its standards or, or somehow coercing or, or relying on cooperation of other countries. It's basically companies' decision to use the European standard as the leading standard. But we also see a uh, tremendous uh, influence through legislative activity where the governments around the world are turning to the EU as the model in large part because the EU has been the most active today, probably already the most experienced, most ambitious regulator of the digital economy that provides the kind of template that the other governments have then uh, turned to in, 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 in trying to regulate their own digital economies. So now the important question is whether this subsequent legislative activity, including the DSA, the DMA, the Data Act, and the AI Act that we will be focusing on today, also have the capability of transforming the global digital economy and not just affecting the practices of companies uh, and other actors within the European Union. So before I turn to the, the speakers, I, I want to mention a couple of things that I, I, I would like to think of the European Union only having an opportunity as a jurisdiction that shapes the global marketplace, but a responsibility of getting it right. So the Brussels effect is capable of exporting good and bad regulations alike. And I sometimes worry about this changing geopolitical environment where there is a temptation to move towards techno-nationalism or digital protectionism in search for self-sufficiency, not least because of the, the tech war that is unfolding between the US and China and what it does uh, in terms of fragmenting and destabilizing global digital supply chains. So I urge the European Union to keep firmly in mind that the goal really is uh, to promote open, global, and interoperable internet, the kind of human-centric digital transformation that serves the Europeans and that, search, uh, that, that serves other citizens well uh, at the same time. My other uh, uh, call for Europeans is to make sure that these regulations also work in practice, that they are implemented with the same ambition that they are being legislated so that we can actually see a true change in the, the market outcomes. So the stake of the Europeans getting this legislative agenda right are extremely high, given um, the, the, the general environment within which the Europe is staking its values and norms over digital economy. So another challenge for Europe is that the European way of governing the digital economy is not the only way out there. I already mentioned that there seems to be a, a growing recognition that this traditional American market-driven private sector-led view of the internet is really waning. There's less and less faith in leaving the, di the digital economy to the tech companies alone and growing recognition that we need democratic governments to, to be in charge and help uh, uh, establish practices that, that safeguard, for instance, users' privacy and, and other rights that are fundamental and important in liberal democratic societies. But there is a growing appeal around the world for the kind of vision that China and some other authoritarian governments are promoting. And that is not one that relies on open global internet. There is much more of a digital authoritarian uh, way of thinking about technology where um, there's much more censorship, the state control of internet and the use of technologies towards digital surveillance that compromises civil liberties of individuals. And I would say that that kind of vision also has a lot of demand in the world that is turning authoritarian. So the, that partially explains why we see a growing cooperation between what was just referred to as like-minded countries, allies that are committed to those principles that were stated in the beginning of this session as well as being European principles, but also principles that are reflected in the Declaration for the Future of the Internet and in other fora that subscribe to those same principles. 
So with that backdrop, I want to now turn to our session today and, and give the floor to a terrific speakers uh, who help us examine a three um, or four regulations in particular, the Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act, Data Act and AI Act, and, and basically examine the, the extent to which these particular regulations contribute to this broader vision of uh, a global uh, open interoperable internet and, and how they potentially influence the markets outside of the EU and the digital lives of individuals outside of the EU and how they relate to various other uh, uh, initiatives, including the global digital compact. So let me now introduce our speakers in the order in which they will be speaking. So we have two speakers helping uh, to guide us through the conversation on the DSA and DNA. We have Prabhat uh, Agarwal, who is the head of unit in the European Commission's DG Connect in charge of digital services and platforms. So his DG, together with some cooperation from DG Competition, is responsible, among other initiatives, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. And before joining the Commission, uh, Prabhat uh, Argawal worked on micro and nanotechnologies in the private sector. So he also brings the valuable perspective of both private and public sectors. We then have Guillermo uh, Canela, who is chief of UNESCO section for freedom of expression and safety of journalists. Um, and his team at UNESCO is currently leading a global multi-stakeholder dialogue to develop a model Go regulatory framework for digital platforms uh, designed to protect freedom of expression and information as a public good. Then we have uh, two speakers uh, discussing the Data Act. We have Veronika Kvala uh, Vinklarkova, uh, who is an attache at the Czech Permanent Representation to the EU. So Czech Republic is currently holding the presidency of the EU and in that role, she is chairing one of the preparatory bodies of the Council, the Working Party for Telecommunication and Information Society. And he's, uh, she's also uh, overseeing uh, the, the negotiations and the work on the Data Act and, and the negotiations on the Declaration on Digital Rights and Principles. Um, we then have uh, Maiko Meguro, who is Director for International Digital Strategy and International Affairs at the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan, known as METI. Uh, so she currently leads METI's team on the G7 digital track and other policy files um, that operationalize that data free flow with trust, the DFFT initiatives. She has worked previously at the WTO, but also the European Commission at the DG Connect. I then want to uh, turn to introducing Axel Voss, who is a member of the European Parliament, has been there for over a decade, uh, uh, shaping the European legislation in that capacity. He's the member of the political group of the European People's Party, an expert on data and digitalization, and uh, right now a shadow rapporteur on this important AI Act that is in the midst of legislative process in the European Union. Finally, um, I want to introduce Mark Rottenberg, who is the founder and president of the Center for AI and Digital Policy, a global network of policy experts and advocates in over 60 countries. Um, I, I find particularly intriguing the Artificial Intelligence and Democratic Values Index that the center publishes which is the first report that ranks national AI policies and practices, and we'll have a chance to learn about that one as well. So, so with that, I want to uh, immediately turn to uh, our first topic, which is the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. And if I can ask uh, Brabat uh, Agarwal, to first take uh, the stage and just very briefly introduce what the DSA and DMA are about. And then I would like to ask a few questions on their global influence. Uh, Anu, this is Pierce O'Donoghue in the room here. Just to say, sorry, we had a last minute uh, change. Unfortunately, Prabhat had to cancel, but we are joined by his colleague Menno Cox, who's in the same team uh, and was uh, intimately involved in the preparation and negotiation of the DSA and DMA. So. So uh, Mena will take the floor in response to your question. Thank you. 
Excellent. Thank you, Menno. Over to you. Thank you so much for, for giving me the floor and um, uh, indeed apologize for, uh, for Prabhat's uh, late cancellation, but I can reassure you that I have worked on platforms for slightly longer than Prabhat, so uh, I should be able to cover that, although it's big shoes to, to fill. Um, I'm specifically dealing with the global aspects of the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, recognizing that um, strong interest in understanding um, the EU's experience. Um, but that brings me directly also to um, what are the global aspects of the DSA and the DMA, and we'll, we'll get to that later as well. But just to quickly mention that um, we believe that we share a global um, problem and opportunity, and that those two regulations that I will quickly mention and present here uh, also translate what we believe are universal uh, values namely to put the citizen back in charge of online content moderation um, based on innovative digital services. So uh, very quickly to set the scene on, on what these acts do, I think what maybe helps is to again remind people of how, just how central digital services have become to our daily lives. Um, and that statistic about what happens every internet minute is always interesting where uh, you can um, read that uh, by now we have more than a million swipes on Tinder every minute uh, and uh, hundreds of hours of video up uploaded to, to YouTube every minute. Um, and this is fundamentally reflecting that um, we have an incredible, an incredible access to information. And I think uh, the fact that this is um, only going to accelerate and is actually a good thing is also reflected in the recent, um, for instance, re relaxation of export controls by the United States on um, technology, including online platforms uh, to supply to Iranian citizens who actually use online platforms to access information, to organize, as do other um, human rights activists around the world. So this is definitely, these rules deal fundamentally with online platforms. So this is social media, online marketplaces, online search engines, uh, which are also serv services, digital services that are central to our lives. And we, we organize our lives around them. And what they try to do, in my view, is to put the citizen back in, the, in control of those services so that they optimally serve our lives. So technology should always, of course, serve our society and democracy. Um, and they uh, hold tremendous opportunities and we're not naive about the fact that they're going to accelerate even further, um, but we need to make sure that um, they do so in a sustainable manner. So indeed, the Digital Services Act is very much about the issue, the issue of online content moderation. So what content do citizens and businesses also have access to and how is that content organized and presented to users and what are those fundamental risks that they also face online because while not being naive about the um, technology accelerating and the fact that uh, it holds great opportunity um, there is also great risks and we're not naive about that either there is of course terrorist content being circulated and there are specific approaches and a global coalition um, that was launched to to tackle that issue and the whole range of illegal issues online is very wide it goes of course from even now illegal short-term rentals that we uh, are also addressing in the european union to illegal wildlife trafficking to very uh, time sensitive issues such as child sexual abuse material um, and many other issues for which um, we need rules to understand um, what are the risks if some of that content goes viral or is actively recommended uh, also looking at the um, Ad fund, advertising funded business model of many of these players. Um, and the Digital Services Act in this sense takes a general approach. So it applies to all uh, sectors of the um, of, uh, of industry and society. And it also takes a general approach in terms of uh, applying to all types of illegal content and societal risks, which includes um, issues such as disinformation, um, which is not necessarily illegal, but can be very harmful. So it applies a procedural approach to make sure um, that we as a society, and that includes government, um, academia, uh, civil society organizations and citizens themselves, know what those risks are and how they're being mitigated. And, and so that we can also all decide 
which services do that well, which services do we want to use, um, what are also their value propositions, um, and how can we ourselves take action to improve and to make sure that we get the content we want, um, such that in the end, uh, we are all acting in a in a safe place, but also a place in which we get access to the content um, that we want and that is valuable to us. In in that sense, um, we we should try to go beyond this um, uh, uh, idea of, of facing a trade off between um, freedom of expression and safety. It, it's really about optimizing all fundamental rights um, online. Uh, this no, is yeah. You. Uh, say a few words on this is extremely helpful on whether you see that the digital services that also will impact non-european citizens and non-european companies uh, absolutely my pleasure and uh, sorry if that was a bit long-winded already but it's such a um, vital topic very quickly on the global aspects you are right to say that the eu needs to get this right and um, for the global effects the immediate global effects we look also at um, enforcement within the EU. Um, elements such as uh, transparency uh, around recommender systems, um, around uh, how platforms deal with minority languages will be of interest to the globe already. Um, having enforcement experience with um, understanding algorithmic amplification, uh, with working with third party auditors who have to audit the mitigation measures will have um, important findings for the rest of the globe. Also, in the EU, we, we will be building up those um, auditing capabilities and enforcement capabilities. Uh, then there's also a specific provision on data access for re researchers, um, which again, uh, the research also needs to be made public. The DSA is very much about transparency. I believe that already benefits the globe and that is a direct effect that even goes uh, comes before um, possible uh, alignment or, or um, actions we can do at an international level. Absolutely. So if I can give you a concrete example, if the, the European DSA, when it bans targeted advertising on minors, do you think it's sustainable for a company like Facebook to then continue to target minors in other jurisdictions? So is that also going to sort of change the expectations, change the global regula regulatory demand for replicating those practices elsewhere as well? It's a very good question. Um, I'd say that um, very often companies th kind of threaten us and other regulators with saying um, the service quality in your jurisdiction will be less. But um, if you take a societal approach, then I'd say that under these rules, the service quality will be the highest. And I would find it um, hard to imagine that um, citizens in other jurisdictions would accept um, lower levels of very elementary um, safety provisions. Absolutely. So let me, uh, I'm going to come back to you as well, but if I can bring uh, Guillaume um, here as well and ask a few words on whether you believe that the DSA, um, also sort of how, how would you describe that it contributes to this broader goal of global and open and interoperable uh, internet? And if you can say a few words of what you would want and what you expect those global effects to be. Thank you, a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation and, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening for everyone. Um, actually, in, we are a global organization as UNESCO. So for us, this possibility when we are actually doing our work to protect and promote human rights in general and in our specific area of mandate freedom of expression, we are always having uh, this exercise in looking into the universal system of human rights but also looking into the regional system of human rights, in this case, the European one, but could be the inter-American one or the African one, the ones that have their own structures of courts and, and regulations and commissions on human rights. So when the EU decided to move forward with the DSA, but we can remember that in the past with their audiovisual directive, or even before that, the Television Without Frontiers directive, those kind of instruments were also important to previous discussions when we were looking into the regulation of the broadcasting system, for instance. No? So your question now about uh, the, the protection of children related to advertisement, I remember when we were working on these kind of things in the broadcasting area, the EU kind of passed to, to discuss these issues were always important in a comparative perspective 
to the universal system of human rights. So in the case of uh, what uh, we think at, at the UNESCO level, uh, the, 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 the kind of lessons learned of this EU process that is very much related to what Menno was saying on how we do this kind of balancing act discussing things that are not easy uh, when we, we need, when a judge, for instance, or a regulator needs to take a decision comparing what to protect freedom of expression or privacy or safety. Those discussions would be particularly relevant for the global discussion on this, but obviously in a much more complex environment, because when you look into the institutionality that is needed to do these things in line with international human rights law, when we in these institutionalities, for instance, a strong rule of law process, having independent regulators, when you try to export that or having the Brussels effect, but to use the title of your book, is not that simple, because we need to make sure that any any attempt to to copy or to understand or to implement similar regulations at other regions and other levels should not only look into the specific regulation in this case but all the structure that is needed to protect human rights again independent judges independent regulators so this would be the balance that we would expect and, and in our case and i finish with that that as you mentioned in your introduction, we are okay, the director general of UNESCO is convening a global debate about regulation and co-regulation in February next year. Uh, and of course, uh, we welcome the discussion that you already took on some of these issues, but actually we would need to look into the plurality and diversity of these discussions in different parts of the world. Uh, very interesting and helpful, Guillermo. Just a very uh, quick follow-up question. Maybe you can comment a little bit on whether you see that at least the kind of the democratic world is quite aligned in its uh, understanding of how um, we ought to regulate online content, how we balance these various con considerations, given our commitment to freedom of expression, but also concern about harmful content online and whether the DSA gets this balance right. And in particular, I'd like to hear from you of whether you see that the DSA is very similar or very much in line with the declaration of the future of the internet or the global digital compact or whether there are some differences that you think ought to be further discussed well let me start by by the last part of your question obviously the dsa is an actual legislation no it's article one two three and four i think the other the, the other processes because we we as un we are not regulators as the eu uh, is uh, so w what we in those different processes is much more offering guidance, principles, uh, broader discussions to our member states and all the other stakeholders, um, offering to them the opportunity if they want to do this well, I mean, to co-regulate, to self-regulate if it is about the companies, but also if it is about the civil society to hold these actors accountable. What are the kind of pol multilateral policy uh, uh, guidance, uh, multilateral policy instructions we can offer to them that they can make this useful again, in our case, always doing this thing aligned with international human rights standards. So this this is the part, first part that is very different. Uh, in the universal system of human rights, the United Nations is not a regulator. In the case of the EU, they are regulators. They can fine people, they can uh, apply administrative sanctions and so on. The other part of your question that I think is important, I have the impression that uh, we are more or less agreeing on the different problems we have, but we still have a long way to agreeing on the details and they matter a lot here. When, for instance, I'm sure everyone agrees that transparency is important, but what exactly is transparency? Then we are not agreeing at all, in all the different aspects of this. We all agree that it's important to counter harmful content, but the definition of harmful content is not that clear. And the last thing I think in the case of UNESCO really wants to underline uh, is that in many situations, we, 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 re, we, we have a reductionistic view of freedom of expression. If we look at the, the Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, freedom of expression is defined using three verbs. The verb impart, that is the, the right to speak, the free speech, 
but also the right to seek and receive information, culture, entertainment. So we need to understand that when the digital ecosystem is flooded with disinformation, misinformation, hate speech, and so on, is not only about to protect the rights to impart, is also about to protect the rights to seek and receive. So we need to do a balancing act, not only in relation to other rights, but internally in the rights to freedom of expression. So uh, this kind of a more sophisticated, in-depth discussion of the rights to freedom of expression is something that we still need to work and then connecting with this idea that information is a public good and how we protect that. Um, terrific. Uh, thank you so much. Um, can I uh, get back to um, also our uh, first uh, speaker? And uh, so I wanted to make sure that we also hear from uh, Meno a little bit about the DMA. So we've now understood what the DSA does to regulate content, but we also know that these decisions on content moderation are made by a handful of companies that control these platforms. So can you maybe help us understand what the DMA is contributing to this conversation about regulating the companies that are in charge of governing the internet in many ways? Absolutely. Uh, we view the DMA as the other side of the same coin of the Digital Services Act, because if you as an approach um, require platforms to take more responsibility and uh, more action, you would also want there to be a vibrant um, pipeline of platform companies that can actually contest each other and and um, and compete on the quality of service they provide to to citizens. This is of course not to say that there isn't a role for the whole ecosystem. Like the Digital Services Act addresses also everything and everyone around platforms. It's not only them; it's government, it's academia, and others. But the platforms are are an important part to the solution of not having to give content moderation or put it in the hands of a single party. Um, and platforms do important um, removal work, takedowns uh, based on terms of service. Uh, they need to do that consistently, of course. But the DMA is really about contestability. It's a fairly new concept whereby um, you no longer talk about competition within a certain market, but you, you have to observe that platforms benefit from these um, data-driven network effects that are almost impossible to overcome for newcomers. So, so what you need is a sort of pressure on this central intermediary to continue to innovate and to invest in um, the quality of their services. And that includes content moderation, which is actually their fundamental business model because they created a safe space for users to interact, which the um, internet uh, apps and the platforms didn't provide in the same, in the same way. So the DMA sets uh, rules for gatekeepers only. So very, the very largest platforms that are truly a gateway for end users to reach other end users or, or businesses, and that can be content providers like uh, media broadcasters, uh, to act fairly, but also to allow for um, what we call vertical interoperability, as well as a degree of horizontal interoperability and data portability. Uh, so very clear cut obligations that they need to comply with in all cases, so that uh, there is innovation on um, on the platform function itself, social media, the content moderation, uh, but also on ancillary services like uh, identity management or payment services, everything that platforms tend to um, bundle up in a single service uh, where they leverage their central position as a, as a gateway to, to users and services. So the DMA sets very clear cut obligations need to be complied with in all cases. And that's different from um, for instance, com the competition rules where platforms can still argue um, efficiency defenses and uh, where the rules are more uh, high level principles that are applied on a case by case basis. These are rules that require compliance um, beforehand. So on the DMA, we are working in parallel uh, as on the DSA, implementing it and making sure those gatekeepers are uh, identified and put in place measures uh, to, to make sure that this contestability becomes the reality. Excellent. Thank you. And I hope we have a chance to return to some of these questions because they're big topics and there would be much more to, to discuss. But this was a helpful overview. In the interest of time, I want to now move to the Data Act and ask Veronica if I could invite you to just help us understand that the main contribution of the Data Act to this broader goal of 
transforming the digital economy in the way uh, that is consistent with European values. Maybe we can unmute Veronica so that we can also have her weigh in. So once again, if I could ask Tech, could you please unmute Veronica Chvalak uh, on the list of participants online, please? And maybe the tech can also remove, uh, unmute uh, Michael Megura, who I will be inviting to speak after Veronica. Good afternoon. Yeah. And now I think we can hear you, Veronica. Yeah. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for, first of all, unmuting me, <laughs> and also for inviting me to be part of this uh, interesting uh, panel discussion. Um, Anu, thank you very much for introducing me before, so I, I don't need to go into much detail, just to uh, say that in our uh, working party for telecommunications and information society, we are dealing with uh, not only data, but also AI, Act, and it's very vibrant working party where most of these digital uh, initiatives are being discussed and where the EU member states are coordinating their common position. So uh, I would be happy to jump onto the topic of Data Act and um, tell you a little bit more about what it is. So in a nutshell, um, Data Act is um, as presented in, in February uh, this year. The main, main goal of this proposal is to unlock potential of the data economy. Uh, and this means uh, that there are three main elements I'm, I'm seeing in the chat that I should turn on my camera, but to be honest, I, I cannot do that either. Uh, it needs to be done by the host, so uh, I'm okay if, if uh, the host will allow uh, that you can turn on my camera. I would be happy uh, to be seen as well. Uh, so uh, in the meantime, uh, coming back to those three main elements of the Data Act. So um, first of all, a Data Act is about unlocking potential of how we uh, store, access and share non-personal data. And um, we are talking mainly about data generated from the IoT products and smart devices. And this is something that was not done in any of previous uh, legislation before. Um, and um, when moving also to the effects, I, I think that we can all say that the uh, Data Act might heavily impact the future of the IoT products, because it not only talks about data access rights for the users, but it also establishes uh, design obligations for the products, for the manufacturers. So there's already one, one very visible effect that the data might have, which is how the products will be built and how related services will be offered to the users together with the products. Second very important part of the Data Act um, is um, having a tool how to access data, and now we are talking about personal and non-personal data, uh, in cases of crisis situations and exceptional needs. And this is uh, more focusing on scenarios B2G. Uh, B2G, yeah, I can be seen. <laughs> uh, nice to see you all. Um, so this second element is about business to government uh, relations. Um, and this is about uh, how governments can access data held by the private companies. And this is very important because uh, COVID, uh, COVID uh, showed us that um, sometimes there are no easy tools how to access, access such important data. So this is a very important element of data as well. And last but not least, uh, we should not forget about cloud market because data Act also talks about how cloud market works and introduces new uh, rules how uh, users can change and switch from uh, cloud providers. Uh, in the Data Act, they are called data processing services providers. So this is what we talk about, but it's all about switching between those providers and allowing a greater level of interoperability so that uh, the cloud market works more efficiently. So this is a little bit introduction and I'm happy to, to follow up on, on the effects. Um, great, Veronica, maybe you can uh, comment a little bit on the sort of opportunities and challenges in implementing this particular act. 
and then maybe say a few words on whether you expect it to set the model for other countries around the world. I'm going to then after you turn to Maiko and hear about Japanese experience, but maybe from the European perspective. So first of all, the, the opportunity and a challenge in implementing and then uh, what the potential global effects are. Yeah. So um, I think the opportunity is really about, uh, as I mentioned in the first place, unlocking the potential because there are a lot of data that are just laying around and they are not used efficiently. And this is uh, the main uh, the main opportunity how to how to allow efficient use of such data in a manner that uh, our economy can be further explored. We can have uh, further and uh, more services offered in, at the EU market. Um, but of course. Uh, this comes uh, with uh, with some um, problems, or I would not call it even a problem, but uh, challenges in implementation because it's it's very technical proposal. And uh, first challenge is to make the the regulation right. We are at the early stage of negotiating, and we need to make sure uh, that uh, the regulations and rights uh, we are introducing can be enforced in an effective manner. Um, and I think that especially when we talk about uh, this. Uh, part uh, of using uh, non-personal data from IoT products, it's really important to talk to uh, stakeholders to really know um, how industries work and uh, what problems can we um, can we um, can we um, kind of uh, address uh, to make sure that it works efficiently because it's not easy and we cannot draft the regulation from the table in in the parliament and in the commission and in in the in the council it needs to be discussed it needs to be um it needs needs to be uh, consulted so that we know what are uh, the problems concerns and how to make sure that it's it's efficient and applicable in practice i think that this is the main uh, main concern and the other problem is timing because uh, in the data act we are introducing uh, some as i mentioned design obligations so we are introducing uh, obligations for manufacturers how they should build and design their products and this will have effect in the long future because uh, we need to take into account that every product has some product life cycle uh, so it, it's going to be a long run uh, to make sure that it all works in the end. But I think that in a nutshell, this is it. And I think the second question was about implications for the non-EU um, uh, EU actors. I think that um, in the in the in the case of non-personal data from IoT products, it's going to be quite impactful because uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of non-EU manufacturers that are placing their products at the EU market, and there they would need to to obey uh, the EU rules, uh, and they need to be um, in line what what with the data act. So I think that there it's going to be very visible. Uh, so it's going to have very direct impact when it comes to non-EU users. I think that in the end uh, there might be this spillover effect because once the products are going to be designed in certain way to allow access of for the European users to access the data, it's going to be very easy to just take the same product and offer it outside of the EU market also for the non-Europeans to have the same access rights because it's going to be very easy by default. Terrific, uh, very, very helpful. So may I now turn to you, Michael, next. Um, because I think we would all benefit from learning uh, from your experience in Japan, including the efforts that uh, that Japanese government has uh, undertaken in this regard, the data free flow with trust, maybe you can help us understand what that is about and how it compares to the data act. Sure, thank you for thank you for your uh, introduction, as well as invitation to this very interesting panel, and it is very pleasure to be here. By the way, um, I'm, I'm trying to put my video on, but I can't. So I think administrator have to unlock it. Oh, now great. So now I'm, I'm on the video. Okay, hello. So thank you so much. So I'm working on the materialization of DFFT with trust. So at this moment, I think people know this concept basically from the G20 summit, uh, ministerial uh, summit uh, declaration, speaking about data must flow when the privacy uh, security and any other uh, important legitimate interest is protected because you know long time ago we thought that data free flow is something like 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 uh, free trade of goods and goods and services but actually it turns out that data is different from the goods and services because this concerns the privacy this can concern national security this can also um, comes with a threat to the threat to the um, the intellectual properties 
So this is where this concept came in, which is the data free flow with trust. So this is basically, we need to unlock the potential or op optimization of the different important element or fundamental values that is attached to the to the data governances. So, so we can't really have one value uh, surpasses the others. So we really need, we really need to have this, uh, the, the privacy must be protected, national security must be secured, then data flows. That's that's how we perceive the data free flow with trust as a concept. But then this has to be implemented. This has to be materialized as an actual policy framework that can enable the data to flow and we can overcome the barriers. So this is what we are working um, as in the Japanese government uh, for the for the priorities of the G7 ministerial and digital ministerial track for the next year because we're taking over the presidency. But of course, um, we're facing a lot of uh, barriers itself to, um, in, to, to, to move on with this free flow with trust at this moment because the how people think that the optimized data governance is, is quite different place to place. Um, I, I, actually, I used to work with the European Union and I, I understand it how proud and how how much uh, advanced the European people, uh, uh, how much European uh, regulations are in terms of the data governances. But of course, there are other countries who have completely different idea about how the data should be governed. And when I'm speaking to many different um, countries and partners from the G7 as well as G20s, I see the tremendous gaps about how the data should flow and what would be the fundamental principle attached to it. So this is where we are really working to have the interoperability across the completely different approaches and the governances about data. So this is also where we are quite keen or quite interested to look at how the data governances in the European Union look at this question of um, interoperability or I think what Menno mentioned, what are the international aspects of those regulations like Data Act or Data Governance Act, um, and also the other important European um, digital digital legislations. But in any case, international discussion is quite developing at this moment, and the Japanese government is quite keen to develop the international cooperation to develop and enhance interoperability across the very different ways of data governances, including European ones. Um, from this perspective, we're also watching EU's, EU's approach quite closely and, of course, deepening our thoughts how our initiative on data free flow with trust can help or work together to build a constructive interoperability across a different jurisdiction um, with expressed um, within the key legislation such as Data Act for the Europe. So that's so 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 for now that's from me, but I'm, I'm quite open to the uh, further discussion on this point. This is very interesting and uh, so I think it's particularly important since we are also observing a lot of pressures towards data localization in different mm -hmm. parts of the world so the trust has not always been the key word and it seems to be that it's not even the default necessarily that the data flows but for some governments the idea that the data needs to be localized and the there's much more to be done before we let the, the, the data flow. But this was really mm -hmm. uh, interesting. And I was curious if you can explain a little bit about how Japan in particular has coordinated with the European Union and how, how the dialogue has worked uh, between the two, two governments. If you think about uh, your work on the DFFT and the European Work of Data Act. Sure. So between the European Union and Japan, we have just established what is called a digital partnership and data is one of the prioritized area that we should work on. So we're talking, we're speaking to the colleague from the European Union about, about the workshop that we should understand actually how our data governance is built on. So data governance doesn't only mean about government governance or regulations, but also it means that what the technological choices that we have and we're really seeking to see the how we can connect the different layers of data governance. Um, and we're trying to see what would be the options of the interoperability that we can develop each other. So of course, like of course, like working to working to have the common, um, like very similar rules is one way. I mean, between European Union and Japan, for the privacy regulation, we do have the uh, the, the the adequacy decisions, which really helps. For the which which really helps, but at the same time, many companies also choose to have the 
have the um, respective contracts um, because since you know they're also working with many different parts of the world. So we're also trying to find out what are the actual barriers that companies are facing, not only companies, but also the research institute and many other data using entities are facing in, the, in daily operation of um, transfer of data. So we established the expert group on the data free flow with trust. And we did a uh, research on the different um, actors about what they actually see as a barriers. And actually interestingly, many um, actors actually mentioned that they, they see the data localization or they see the difference of regression are really difficult for them. But actually the prioritized barriers for them is more on the transparency and also the interoperability on the technological side because they many companies also see that they would like to develop the applications or their own solution to those um, barriers that they face but they also actually faces a lot of issues about um, not only the difference of the regulation or governances but also they see the many different ways that how um, how how different companies and how different governments builds their own data governances on the different technological choices so that that's how i see it so for for even between the european union and japan you have to really see the different layers of the interoperability to have the to 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 enhance actually the data flow between these two jurisdictions terrific so thank you both uh michael and uh, thank you veronica i want to now again in the interest of time to bring our third um uh, legislation uh, into the conversation and invite if I can have Axel Voss, who I understand to be in the room, to speak. And maybe you can walk us through just very briefly what is the main goal of the AI Act that the EU is now legislating? And if you can also give us a sense of the time frame of when we expect this to emerge from the parliament and actually then become adopted as a legislation. So, um, Axel, over to you, please. So thanks a lot, Anno, uh, for the nice introduction and uh, also for the commission. Uh, thanks to create this event. And um, it's, I think it's very important to have this also on the IGF panel. Um, so the goal of the AI Act um, is that we are trying to build excellence and uh, trust to our citizens in using algorithms and um, having these also be part of our day-by-day -day life. We would also like uh, to ensure human rights um, because some of these um, algorithms or some of these um, artificial intelligence products um, might be in a way harmful so that we need to have a balance here and also what we would like to do is, is strengthening the research and also the our industry capacity so that we have a frame for our society how we would like to deal with the um, artificial intelligence and the devices who might contain this and um, here we have a lot of uh, issues, uh, but regarding the time frame, just uh, let me give you also this idea. It's, it's expected so far that we are coming forward in the European Parliament till the end of March, probably voting on it in the committee in May, latest hopefully. Um, and uh, the Council is already a step further. They are having their, their own approach on these and, and then we can start trilogue um, before the summer break or directly after the summer break and then hopefully ending these at the end of next year. So this is um, how we are thinking on this right now but the importance of this uh, legislative tool um, shouldn't be underestimated. So if we are not doing this right then um, all the wealth and um, uh, competition and so goes to other regions in the world. So we have to be very careful here in not changing the wrong track. Um, uh, 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 yeah, not uh, well, coming to the right track, uh, let me put it this way. So um, this is then all about the definition. 
it's about the governance, it's about the safeguards for the deployer, about the safeguards for the system itself. It's um, especially, and here we have to focus on what is an AI high risk system, because the AI Act itself would like to focus only on high risk systems. Um, we need to think about what we should do with the so-called general purpose AI. Um, we would like to have a trustworthy AI that is lawful, ethical and robust. And uh, here we are coming also to one point what is very important, um, sandboxes. Um, so we have in mind two cases. One is a company is um, new and has no data at all but how we can provide data for this new business model or new idea, or there is a company having already data in place, but using this not for the purpose this was collected, and how we can manage this one also. Therefore, sandboxes are very much important, especially if you're linking this to the GDPR, where it is not forbidden in a way, but it's very restrictive how we can use personal data. And to come to a result of, out of algorithms, what is a gender balanced, non-discriminatory and non-biased, you will need massively personal data to create a result like this, what a legislator has in mind. And um, also we are creating a kind of a gov governance here and an expert uh, group um, where we can also, uh, the, and the Commission is then dealing with it, um, where we can also have the expertise around what is high risk and what not at the end. And uh, the question of liability is not integrated in this uh, proposal so far, but is another proposal what we have got, I think, one a couple of weeks ago, and uh, but here also we would like to come to an end this term, so meaning uh, April 2024. This is very helpful. Uh, thank you, Axel. And I, in my work, sometimes suggested that one of the reasons why the European legislation has been so influential as a template for other governments is that it is already a result of a compromise. You have many different political views, many different member states that need to sign on to that legislation. So in that sense, it is the kind of legislative drafting that results in the kind of legislation that is designed to work in different legal systems, which has sometimes been easier than to export that and implement in other jurisdictions compared to, for instance, the legisl legislation in the United States. And I think the way you discuss some of the, the sticking points and important decisions that the Parliament now faces. That deliberation probably contributes to the kind of balance that emerges from the process. Can I ask you one question? When you are legislating, do you feel that you are now drafting AI legislation for Europe, or are you conscious that it will have a broader, potentially global influence? Um. So, of course, we have in mind that this has also an, a potential global influence um, because we are expecting also that all AI systems working as a kind of a service also in the EU um, is also respecting these ideas and our um, values and, and the legislation. Um, so, but because we are sitting in a round of seven different political parties with seven different um, opinions, um, this is not always on our mind if when we are discussing the definition or sandboxes or so on. But um, if, if you're stepping back a little bit and you're watching uh, the whole situation, then of course you think um, this might be something or a, a kind of a key element for the future and uh, hopefully also for the like-minded uh, countries who might think in the same direction. Uh, perfect. That is a great segue for me now to move to Mark and, and uh, have him share more of an American perspective on the AI Act. So, um, I do want to talk about the, the uh, Democratic AI and Democratic Values Index, but maybe you can briefly give us kind of an American reaction to the AI Act. What is it accomplishing? What are some concerns that you might have on what the Europeans are trying to accomplish? 
Well, first, let me thank uh, the commission for the opportunity to join you today. And great to see you anew and Axel. It's been uh, fascinating to watch uh, the reaction on the US side. I think it's fair to say that there's a wide range of opinion. Uh, certainly, as a general proposition, the tech industry does not like to be regulated. And I think on the tech industry side, there's a sense uh, that if they can avoid regulation, they'd like to do that. On the other hand, I think there's also growing recognition that the GDPR um, in the United States actually helped stabilize uh, public concerns about privacy because the US Congress itself was having difficulty passing legislation. And as you've observed, as companies moved in the US to comply with the GDPR, were able to establish some trust and confidence in their services. So unlike the um, almost hostile reaction to the GDPR, I think there's also, let's say, a greater openness and willingness to see how the AI Act might uh, establish consumer confidence and, and basic market circumstance. But that is on the, on the tech industry side. I think the US government itself likely views the initiative more uh, favorably. Uh, we've seen positive statements from Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, from the National uh, Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, and from the former White House Advisor Lynn Parker, uh, speaking positively about uh, the efforts of the EU to move forward the AI Act. And then, of course, most recently, we have from the Office of Science and Technology Policy the uh, blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. And just to clarify any confusion that may surround that document, it was never intended as a legislative proposal. Uh, executive uh, agencies in the White House don't have uh, lawmaking authority. But I think understood as a white paper, it's actually quite influential. And it sets out five key principles um, that do align with many of the uh, pillars contained in the um, EU AI Act. So I think um, the US is anticipating uh, that the AI Act uh, will be adopted, that it will have uh, consequence uh, for US firms. Uh, I don't think the uh, opposition is as strong as it was certainly with the GDPR. And I do think some in the US government actually uh, welcome the initiative on the EU side. Very helpful. Maybe now we can also extend the discussion to China. And, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on whether the Brussels effect will reach Beijing or whether Beijing will reach Brussels, uh, Washington and the rest of the world. So we know that China is very active in both developing AI, but there's been also some attempts to uh, sort of establish the Chinese policy view uh, around the AI. So maybe you can describe a little bit your thoughts on what influence China will have the future development and regulation of AI. Right. So we've been absolutely fascinated over the last few years studying uh, the regulatory approach of China. As I'm sure people know, in uh, November, uh, China adopted the personal information uh, protection law largely modeled after the GDPR. Uh, it's an influential and comprehensive approach uh, to data protection, even in, introduces some improvements. Uh, there is new regulation on uh, recommendation algorithms, actually looks very much like Article uh, 63 in the DSA. And what we're beginning to see in China, I think, is an approach that combines a commitment both to uh, leadership, some would say dominance, in the tech field, that's certainly an ambition uh, for 2030, with regulation to create the circumstances that enable uh, the continued uh, uh, presence of Chinese firms. And to me, this is actually fascinating because in our traditional analysis, we see the United States leading on uh, innovation, we might say, and we see the EU leading on uh, regulation. I think in, in this moment, we could fairly say that China has the ambition of trying to lead in, in both domains, uh, creating a Beijing effect and certainly creating some new challenges uh, for the US and the EU. Um, so that is fascinating to, to hear about your views on China's ambition. And I think we all eagerly watching whether that ambition actually will translate into to concrete 
uh, uh, outcomes. So I um, would like to also uh, tell us a little bit about the research that you are doing on the AI and Democratic Values Index. What are some of the key findings that, that you could potentially share with us? Great, thank you. I'm going to very briefly um, share the screen only to show you one page from our website. Um, you'll find our website just searching, of course, Center for AI or Center for AI and Digital Policy. This was from the release of our report, uh, second edition of our report, February last year. We were pleased to have uh, Eva Kali join us, uh, Stuart Russell and others to talk about our findings. And you'll see um, over in the left column some of our key highlights. We've conducted the first comparative study of national AI policies and practices that includes both uh, a narrative evaluation, but it also includes a series of metrics so that we have the ability to uh, quantify as against uh, 12 uh, key metrics we've established how countries are doing in terms of uh, democratic values. And it's a useful tool because at a moment in time, we can compare countries against one another, and we can also see over time changes in countries' practices. And I would like just to give a shout out to UNESCO, uh, because last year we actually modified our methodology to acknowledge the support that countries expressed for the UNESCO recommendation on AI ethics. We thought that was a big step forward. We're making a slight modification in our methodology this year as we begin to explore uh, the implementation of the UNESCO recommendation on AI ethics. Extremely um, helpful and valuable work, and uh, I am really glad you shared that so that we can all continue uh, to, to watch the, the results. So let me at this point uh, turn the floor to the questions. I want to make sure that our audience will have a chance to engage with our speakers on these topics. Since I'm not in the room, um, I would like to ask Pierce and Belmira um, moderate the, the Q and A. Or see if you have hands up uh, in the room, please. Thank you, Anna. We we will do so. So, uh, of course, we're also opening the floor to all of those who are online. So, perhaps if I could ask uh, if uh, physically or electronically anyone would like to put their hand up and uh, um, make a brief comment or ask a question. Yes, please. And if you could introduce yourself and your organisation. Thank you. Um, hello everyone. I'm not going to say good afternoon or good morning because I don't know the time zones. <laughs> um, my name is uh, Jordano Suelde. Please call me Jordi. Um, I'm from Rutgers International, um, but also an Ethiopian. <laughs> so welcome to Addis. Um, my my question as, as someone who's coming from not these countries <laughs> that, that were spoken of uh, and I was surprised with a lot of uh, the documentation and the legislation that has been shared because these are things that we always look forward to, spe especially in living in countries where we're talking about human rights, where it's either the question between the right to impart information or the right to life. We are here trying to survive uh, on a daily basis on information or misinformation rather that winds up um, taking the lives of so many. So my question would then be to the team, because there are so many amazing legislations. And as, as, as a person that's coming from a country that would love to have some regulation on these uh, disinformation or the misinformation that is happening across the world, are there tips that you can share? Um, if, if just one from maybe our speakers, just something that we can actually go back to to our governments to say these are things that we'd love to have regulated as as part of the countries you know that have done so such great work uh, whether it's in the eu or japan or uh, the us <laughs> we would love to get some practical tips one thing that could work that we can take away thank you so much uh, well i just relay your request would any of our fine speakers like to to take that challenge of well, giving a tip Please. I mean, I'll make two quick points. One is that I think we have to be careful not putting too much burden on people to deal with these very complex and technical problems. So I very much agree with the, the spirit of the question. I think governments need to take more responsibility, need to conduct oversight, um, and need to legislate uh, so that we're not all left on our own sorting through this. But I will make a small technical suggestion. 
Um, and I do have some background with the um, evolution of the internet. I helped in the early days with the creation of the .org domain to uh, promote non-commercial use of the internet. And one of the lessons I took away from that time is that access to the URL, the ability to actually see the, um, the string of characters associated with the website that you're going to can be extremely helpful in determining uh, the validity or authenticity. And one of my concerns over the last several years has been the increasing difficulty. You know, we hide our links behind text and email, or we go to platforms where we don't know the site that we end up on. I would say if you can examine the URL, that will give you a lot of information intuitively about the website that you're going to and the quality of information you're receiving. Thank you, Mark. And could I then call on our colleague Menno, who might come in on this question? Yes, very important question. And um, one tip is, of course, difficult to give because there are many, but I would say that specifically regarding platform regulation, it is important um, to see that the whole of society approach uh, is the key. So before moving to platform regulation, I would say Govern governments should focus on the ecosystem around platforms, including um, quality journalism, the independent judiciary, the, the building blocks that we all know of so that you can embed your regulation um, in uh, a fundamental rights approach, uh, which uh, then allows to leverage that ecosystem uh, to make societies resilient. And that is a, a tough order, but, but something that's really crucial uh, precisely to prevent um, creating a space for suppressing freedom of speech. And I can see Michael also have her hand up. Sorry. Sure. I also would like to make a small comment from the government of Japan. And also this perspective is basically from the non-Western perspectives. It might be also interesting from uh, in the perspective of diversity. Um, but I actually also recall the point that Menno made, which is we should really understand what is ecosystem around what you're trying to regulate. And also ecosystem can also be quite different place to place. So I'm not sure what would be the most relevant ecosystem analysis for your own society. But this is very important to understand what your society is actually built up on. And also government should take the very much responsibility to um, sometimes very, very hard, but you have to really draw the line as an principles. But then beyond that principle, different government chooses a different approaches. Like European European um, society basically chooses the regulations. Like they all have the very strong regulation, put a lot of efforts to, uh, to, to, to draft a lot of legal documents. And that also works, particularly uh, for the society like Europe, which is consisting of the 27 different cultures and countries. Whereas for the country like Japan, this is more homogeneous type society. We share a lot of um, like non-spoken common sense already, then we really chooses certain more flexible approaches. We call them agile governance. So we build a very strong principles, but beyond that, we let the, the stakeholders, like most stakeholders to actually work on how they implement them. But government also set the review system and also those like most stakeholders can also join in to actually interact with government to how they also want to build their own governances to implement the principles. That can also be another approach. Uh, Guillaume, I see that you would like to take the floor. Very briefly to add one thing that for this question for us is very important. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have simple solutions for complex problems. and. This issue of disinformation, I think we think now that we have reached the point that we need to go into the specifics. Because we have uh, already discussed a lot, we need to counter disinformation and misinformation that is true, and then all that what Mano just said is it's very important. But it's not the same to counter disinformation and misinformation in the elections process, or when we are discussing climate change, or when we are discussing migration. So. We need to go into the specifics. What is the risk assessment that the companies and other actors need to do when they are countering this information in developing process during elections to counter this information for climate change or for health issues? Because there are important differences here and different strategies 
that need to be considered when we are talking on those different processes. So we, we need to go further in this discussion to really reach the results we want, obviously always uh, using as, as basics, uh, a human rights based approach. Thank you. So are there, is there anyone else in the room who'd like to raise a question or make a point? Yes, please. Thank you very much. I'm Sophia Longwood, German Youth Delegate. Um, it seems like in the beginning it was said that the idea behind the act is to put the citizen back in charge. However, it was also said that it does not need full transparency and that the government in the end should take care of that. But um, if you want to put the citizen back in charge, you need informed consent in a way and inform the public, engage also civil society maybe. So my question is, how do you make sure to sufficiently inform the public about your legislation in the EU, but even on a global scale? Thank you. So thanks a lot uh, for this question and also for attending here the IGF. Um, I would always say the European Union is the most transparent organization in the world. But of course, you have to do your, um, your own selection on these enormous amount of information. Um, of course, with every um, legislative um, act, there is also special information around what you can uh, find and how this can be used. Um, of course, the all the legal tools are also um, having in mind, if I generalize this a little bit, how we can survive digitally in a more and more bipolar developing world. And uh, this is very much important for the EU. And um, here, of course, this has to do with human rights, individual rights, and so on. And, and we are trying also to get this balance, but we need also competition. And, and uh, therefore, we have to have um, in mind that this should be balanced everywhere. And because of the fast um, evolving and, and uh, so development, um, we as a legislator, I would still say we are not flexible enough. We, we need to come or to think about different forms of being a democratic legislator to um, catch up with the developments and not years later where the problem is occurring um, then we might think about and then we take our time in discussing. No, I th this is probably not the majority um, opinion in the parliament but I still see um, a lack of adapting new technologies immediately as soon as they are out or as we have a kind of an idea. But this is our way so far approaching in trying also to get trustworthy elements in all these legislative papers and also having in mind that this should also serve our citizens. But of course, industry aspects are also part of it. Thank you. And Mark, I see that you'd also like to come in on this question. You're on mute. In our um, Democratic Values Index, two of the 12 metrics actually uh, relate to the ability for the public to participate in uh, decision making regarding AI policies. So one question asks, are the country's uh, policies for AI readily available to the public? And another question asks, is there meaningful opportunity for public participation in the formulation of the national AI policies and strategies? And actually, the, the good news here, having done this detailed comparative analysis, is that many countries over the last several years have created uh, open processes to uh, seek public comment and to incorporate public comment. We've actually dedicated a page on our website called The Public Voice to call attention to those situations where the public is invited to express the views. So I think th this was a very important question. And of course, as we're thinking about how these decisions are made, we should think not only about the quality of, of the outcome, which is important, but we should also think about the quality of the process, which I would say can be equally important. 
Okay, thank you. So, Menno, I'm going to give you 30 seconds before I give the floor back to Anu so that she can wrap up before we have to close the session. Over to you, Menno. To complement the others, because we now talked about transparency in policy making, but the Digital Services Act specifically indeed balances that transparency and the need for government intervention. And I think in an interesting way, um, it injects transparency um, for all actors in the ecosystem. So trusted flaggers need to be transparent about their work, just as platforms need to be transparent about how they engage in content moderation. Um, academic research need to be published and also the auditing um, m efforts that are done need to be published so that citizens can understand exactly what is going on and can inform their, themselves and indeed take action to play their part um, in the content moderation um, that we need to do as a society. So at the same time, the government intervenes to actually vet researchers to make sure they're independent, to select third party auditors and to uh, make sure um, trusted flaggers indeed don't um, overstep their role. So there's also that strong uh, role for government, um, but, and that's very important maybe to finish on, the DSA uh, maintains this cardinal principle, which is that there's no um, general monitoring. So it safeguards um, our citizens from being subject to general monitoring by online platforms, which can be imposed by governments. So it's okay, a, it's great. Man, I'm going to stop you there. I'm stopping you now. Thank you very much. But really, uh, we have to give the last word to our moderator, Anu, before we close the session. So Anu, back to you to wrap up. Harris, uh, just very quickly, I want to use my final minute to extend my warmest thanks. I thought this was a, a extremely important, wide ranging, rich conversation that was both informative, sometimes disconcerting, but also very promising. And I take great comfort in just listening to how many thoughtful individuals are bringing their own expertise to, to try to solve a very difficult set of governance challenges. So I think just to a, a deeper dive into these four different policy domains reveal to us how there is no single legislation, there's no single policy that is going to help us govern all these different challenges. But at the same time, it reveals there's no single actor who has all the answers. So it's the dialogues like we've had today that I think help the Europeans and help the rest of the world to, to bring this conversation forward and use the expertise to, to appreciate the challenges and make the best of those challenges and, and use the tools that they have to, to uh, move us towards that vision that has been articulated and that all of us can recognize both the significance and the urgency of the digital transformation and the importance of getting it right. So thank you uh, for the important work that all of you are doing. Thank you for taking the time to join in this conversation and for the many rich insights that you shared. So have a great day, everyone. Good continuation of the conference and my very best regards. Thank, thank you very much, Anu. And on behalf of the European Commission, I would like to thank our speakers uh, for their very thoughtful and useful inter in, uh, interventions. Uh, the, our two questioners uh, who, who, who had very pertinent questions. And of course, Anu, I'd like to thank you for, for guiding us and framing our discussion. So thank you very much for that. Uh, this has been very enriching for us. Uh, we wanted to continue the discussion, uh, and I wish you all a, a very successful continuation of this very important IGF week. Thank you all, and goodbye. <laughs>